Numbers chapter 21 verse 4 through 9. I will read in Tongan version. No mipa vai wataha verse 5 ki hono hiva. Pe nau tuku fononga tuku mehe mo onga ko hoa e hala ke tahi kolokula ko e nau alu takai ke fonua o ito mi. Pe nai hoa ai lau maari e o kakai ko e uhi ko e hala. Pele kakai ki o tua mo Moses ko ha ku mo omi ai ki mau tolu me ispete ke mate i he tofa he o ku kai ha me kai pe o ku kai ha vai pe o ku fagalile ai mau mo oi ki he nge ensi me kai ni pe fe ka wa tu si hova ki kakai ha fanga ta vela pe na o se kakai pe na mate ha fu tola he pe ha o e kakai ki mo Moses o na pe he Ko mau hia, he ko mau talaka ia si hova mo koe. Ke ke hu ke si hova, ke de ave e whangangata me te ki mau tolu. Pe hu fekina e Moosese e kakai. Pe a folofola, a si hova ke a Moosese, ngau i hao ngata vela. O ai ke a fuka, pe a kapehe, pe a iloanga taha ko uusia, tene sio ki ai, tene mo ui. Pe ngau hi e Moosese e ngata palasa, o ne ai ki a fuka, pe a hili ea, pe a kaa kua uu a taha e ngata, pe a ne whakasio ki e ngata palasa. Na ane mo o i ai, e meni. Let my people go is the call of God given to Moses, to those in power, and to those in captivity. Let my people go continues to be the call of God given to each one of us as we seek to respond to the systems, institutions, and beliefs that hold anyone in captivity. Every time I read the story of the Hebrew people, I'm reminded that their story is my story and your story. Like us, the Hebrew people travel at times a difficult road of faith that includes loss, captivity, wilderness wanderings, and liberation. How distrustful the Hebrew people are of the journey and of God's grace. Even though God had richly provided for them in the past, 
They fail to rest in the assurance that God will continue to provide for them. And instead, they begin to complain loudly to Moses, their leader. There is no food and water, and we detest this miserable food, which says to me that they had food. They just didn't like the food they were given. Do you know something about this? I know I begin to squirm a bit in recognition when reading the story of the Hebrews wandering in the wilderness. This life of faith pushes us out on a journey that is full of challenges and at times not very comfortable. Like those Hebrew people, we are on a journey together as we face the pervasiveness of racism and it's not at all comfortable. I give thanks that we United Methodists are engaging more deeply in the task of becoming an anti-racist people. If there's anything this COVID time that can be called even remotely a blessing, it's that we have found ourselves connected to one another in ways we hadn't considered before. Our actions, how we choose to live, whether we stay at home when we're ill or wear a mask and engage in social distancing directly impacts the well-being of another. The very breath we share can impart the virus which can make another ill or even bring death. And it's because of this COVID time when our lives were slowed down by the virus that we all had a front row seat and couldn't turn away from George Floyd's death as the breath was slowly choked out of him which helped particularly white America recognize the stranglehold racism has had on our siblings of color. It's mobilized us in ways long needed as we live into our baptismal vows to resist evil and injustice in whatever forms they present themselves. It hasn't been easy and it's definitely not comfortable. As part of my spiritual practice last month, I spent part of every day learning something about black history I didn't know before. And I shared what I learned with my Facebook friends. Sometimes the research uncovered amazing treasures as I learned of people like Bessie Coleman, who became the first black and Native American woman to earn a pilot's license in 1921, or the creation of Empire, an all black town established in Wyoming. But my research also opened my eyes to the terror and trauma of lynchings, of the dehumanizing power of slavery and segregation, and how systemic racism robbed individuals of opportunities and the wider society of gifts and wisdom from those deemed less than. I didn't want to look at those parts of history that brought death on an entire people. But like those Hebrew people who were dying by snake bites and found that by looking at the very thing that brought death they would live, I knew that by looking at racist things that have caused death, life could be released and we could all find liberation. How about you? Are you willing to look at racism? Really look at it? Hear the painful stories you'd rather avoid? Listen to the sobs that well up from places of deep hurt and hold the sighs that are too deep for words? When we do so, when we allow the Holy Spirit to open in us a curiosity to know lives that are different from our own, when we wonder about the lived experiences of another, we are led to a life-giving place because rising up within us is an empathy that compels us to work for a world where every child of God, no matter the skin color, place of origin, gender identity, or sexual orientation, can thrive and grow into the fullness of life as God intends. In the message, version of John 3 are these words. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and everlasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. God so loved the world. God so loved the world and we are tasked as followers of Jesus with loving this world and one another into the fullness of that divine love. Racism defiles faith for faith is always propelled by love's power. There is nothing grounded in love about racism. And when we fail to engage in the hard but necessary anti-racist work, we're not allowing love to direct us, move us and motivate us. We in the Mountain Sky Conference have been looking hard at racism and learning how to be anti-racist. And so to do some research, I went to Southwest Colorado to visit one of the internment camps 
that Japanese Americans were sent to during World War II. Up and down the West Coast, Japanese American families were removed from their homes with just one piece of luggage and sent to one of the camps. As we were driving to the camp, we listened to the testimony of some of the people who had been sent there. One man said, because of our skin color, because of our culture, people were afraid of us. We were told that we were sent there to protect us, but then why were we kept behind barbed wire with machine guns that were trained on us on the inside, not those on the outside of the camp? As I stood in the barrenness of the camp, I was struck by the fact that woven into the history of the United States from the very beginning is a fear of those deemed other that has resulted in the displacement of people who are not white. Indigenous people were driven from their sacred land into ever shrinking reservations. Africans were captured in their homeland and brought to the United States, Japanese Americans were driven away from their homes and businesses and sent to the camps. There are so many examples of our inhumanity towards each other, and it challenges a faith that's grounded in God's love for the world and all people. The gospel calls us to a love that reaches out and embraces many, a love that doesn't isolate us, or as Dorte Zole writes, protect us from disturbances, but, but love melts our defenses and makes us more disturbable. The love which we're called to by Christ has a dimension of trust and responsibility for each other and the absence of jealousy and arrogance. There is the element of solidarity and the absence of opportunism and bitterness. This is the love which makes life worthwhile. This is the love that can change a world so scarred by hate and greed. Jesus concludes that all the commandments of the Torah can be summed up by the practical performance of love. Jesus insisted that love is a verb with its meaning fully contained in its action. Love is something done, not merely said. God so loved the world and calls us to the task of love. How is love expressed in your tasks, your interactions with colleagues, and your understanding of your work's impact on the greater community? How is love expressed through what you offer friends and families and your spouse? Is it a love that isolates or connects? How does love enter into your decision about whether or not you wear a mask? How is it a sign of your love for your neighbor? How does love guide your decision-making process? How do you use it to judge right action? How does love increase your ability to hear the lived realities of people who aren't like you, especially people who are of another race or culture? How does it propel you to make a commitment to create change? May love undergird our efforts as we look at the harsh realities of racism. May love cause us not to turn away, but open ourselves up to listen, learn, and respond as Christ's body, so all may live. Let us pray. Merciful and redeeming God, you have shown us a path, yet we have trusted our ways and not yours. We have been and continue to be convinced that our plans, that our paths, that our systems, and that our structures would be better than yours. So now we are faced with the reality that we have caused pain and harm to our siblings, thus we have prevented healing and wholeness for others and for ourselves. We are so far from experiencing your promise, so far from beloved community. We ask for humility so that we can listen deeply to the cries within our midst. Give us courage not to deny, to come close enough, to be in proximity of, to witness the pain not to exploit, but to know. We pray for your spirit to give us endurance to be diligent and not look away from you, for you have shown us a path. God, forgive me. May I, 
may we have the audacity to ask you to grant us a holy imagination and the moral courage to follow your ways so that repentance will come forth and transformation will be made so that your beloved children, those who have been historically and continue to be marginalized, discriminated against, taken advantage of, beaten and murdered, will be treated with love, equity, and dignity. Through Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. My siblings in Christ, God calls to us, let my people go. May we each take on the Moses ministry of liberation so that all God's beloved children will thrive in a land of love, a place of justice, equality, dignity, and honor. May the peace of Christ be yours as you take up this sacred task. Amen.